Scripture teaches that Jesus, though he did many miraculous works, was consistently, unceasingly, under pressure to conform to the influences of the society around him. Mark, third chapter, we're going to read verses 1 to 6. entered again into the synagogue, there was a man there which had a withered hand. And they watched him, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day, that they might accuse him. And he saith unto the man which had the withered hand, Stand forth. He saith unto them, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days, or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they held their peace. But when he had looked around about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he said unto the man, Stretch forth thine hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. And the Pharisees went forth, and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him, how they might destroy him. So what we find is, the emphasis is on the miracles and the things that Jesus was doing, and the multitude of blessings that he was bringing out, but we want to take a look at the opposition that he encountered every step of the way. Uh, drop down to verse 13. We're going to read verse 13 to 21. He goeth up into a mountain, and calleth unto him whom he would, and they came unto him. And he ordained twelve that they should be with him, that he might send them forth to preach, and to have power to heal sick, sicknesses, and to cast out devils. And Simon, his surname Peter, and James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, and he surnamed them Barajanes, which is the sons of thunder, and Andrew, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon, the Canaanite. And Judas Iscariot, which also betrayed him, and they went into a house. And the multitude cometh together again, so that they could not so much as eat bread. When his friends heard of it, they went out to lay hands, to lay hold on him, for they said, He is beside himself. So, for every good action that he was doing, there was opposition that was also present to try to pressure him into compromising or uh, totally shutting down the way in which he was going. Turn to the Gospel of John, the seventh chapter, verses one to eight. This takes place after all his disciples have left him. <clears throat> Not the apostles, but the disciples walked away from him. <clears throat> after these things, Jesus walked in Galilee. We would not walk in Jewry because the Jews sought to kill him. So here we have, here we have a situation. Miracles taking place, healings taking place, miraculous occurrences, yet they all walked away from him except the twelve. The Jews were out to kill him. Verse 2. Now the Jews' feast of the tabernacles was at hand. His brethren therefore said unto him, Depart hence, go into Judah, <coughs> to Judea, that the thy disciples may see the works that thou doest. For there is no man to doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. But neither did his brethren believe in him. 
Jesus said unto them, My time is not yet come, but your time is already ready. The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify of it, the works thereof are evil. Go ye up to this feast. I go not up yet unto the feast, for my time is not yet full come. Everybody was on Jesus' case. These are his brothers telling them, knowing that if he exposed himself, they were out to kill him. He says, well, go on and show yourself. He had nobody. But the twelve. He mentioned his disciples. Well, go on and show them. Uh, you, you can give them confidence. And nobody else, basically what the tell them is nobody else is interested. Now, what is it that kept Jesus from capitulating? What is it that kept Jesus strong in the face of all of this? <clears throat> a consistent, consistent harassment. Turn to Matthew, the 11th chapter, and we're going to read verses 15 to 19. the 11th chapter 15 to 19 he that hath ears to hear let him hear in other words what he's saying is for those who have spiritual maturity to understand but whereunto shall I liken this generation it was like unto children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows and saying we have piped unto you and you have not danced we have mourned unto you you have not lamented but John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He hath a devil. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a man gluttonous and a wine bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. But wisdom is justified of her children. What is he saying here? He's saying, basically, this is a society which can never be pleased. John the Baptist was an individual <clears throat> straight-laced in the sense that he didn't project anything other than his appearance and they found fault with him. So the Son of Man came eating and drinking and you say, well, here's a greedy guy, he's gluttonous and he's a wine drinker. He hangs out with the publicans and sinners. So Jesus is saying, basically, you're a society that pressures the righteous to conform to your priorities, your demands. But he says, but wisdom is justified of her children. What does that mean? It means that the fruits of your righteous effort are going to come forth, irregardless of the pressures of society. You do what you know, what you know, is that you should do because of who you are. Jesus knew who he was. And there's nothing that anybody would ever say to pressure him into the slightest deviation from what he set out to do. <clears throat> they called him demon-possessed when he did his miracles. They accused him of doing him in uh, Satan's name. They ridiculed him. It wasn't just when he got to the cross. Every step of the way, he was under tremendous pressure to compromise, to turn aside. But he knew who he was. He knew who the Father was. And the understanding of the truth of why he was here, what he was to do, the Father being with him, and the strength that flows from the Spirit strengthened him through everything, took him to the cross and beyond. The principle that we had dear to here, and we're going to go into that principle. 
scripture teaches, we remain free from the world's influences by applying our mind to God's renewing process. In Romans, the 12th chapter, verses 1 to 2. Romans 12, verses 1 to 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is a good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For all the saying here, commitment is the prime directive, sacrificial life, set aside holy for God. That's what Jesus did. And having done that, he says, be renewed, <coughs> be renewed in your mind. And the renewing will keep us from conforming to the pressures of the world and will transform us into the image of Christ. Now I want to take a look at a little bit at this renewing process. Scripture tells us the renewing process takes place daily. Turn to 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, verse 16. I missed that. Uh, Second Corinthians. Okay. Fourth chapter. Verse sixteen. Oh, it's cause. We faint not. <clears throat> but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. It's an automatic process that's taking place on the inside. And it takes place daily. What's being said here is this the renewing process is where we get our eternal life from. It is <clears throat> a process that takes place by the action of the Holy Spirit conjunction with our spirit it is a renewal a revitalization a wellspring that's consistently going on on the inside that's why we will live eternally because we are eternally renewed now what he's saying here is that the outward is perishing because it's not redeemed like the inward is therefore there is no renewing process taking place on the outside, what's taking place on the outside is the aging process. But what's taking place on the inside is the renewing process. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> what he goes on to say is that when we tap into this renewing process, then we gain an understanding of all truth. Jesus was able to withstand the pressures of the society of his day because he stood in God's truth. He saw things as they actually were, not as they appeared to be. He saw the society trying to pressure him into conforming to its priorities, which he could see for what they were. So he would never enter into that. Turn to the Gospel of John. 16th chapter. Renewing by the Spirit enables the saint to see the world as it is, not as it appears to be. The Gospel of John, the 16th chapter, verse 13. <clears throat>
Verse 13, you said. Mm -hmm. John 16, verse 13. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. So when you stand <coughs> in the truth, the light that the renewing process will bring to our mind, to our thinking, the obstacles that are coming against you, you see them for what they are, not what they appear to be. <coughs> if you're operating in the carnal, then you'll be under the influence of what they appear to be. So come to them. If you're operating in the spiritual, you stand against them because you see them for what they are. <coughs> Images, things that have form but no substance. The enemy is a master of manipulation and imitation. And he manipulates the whole human race <coughs> through the senses. And through the senses, people put limitation on their lives. Satan engineers that. The mind will give you a limitation, a belief that it's as far as you can go, you can't go any further. And for the most part, people live in a box. A box of limitations. But the spirit will let you know that there is no permanent limitation. Everything, everything, everything in the physical world changes. So no matter how bad the problem appears to be, it can't stay because it's subject to change. So the spirit, under the renewing process, <clears throat> will lead you into all truth and you'll be able to see the thing exactly as it is. And when he talks about he will show you things to come, <clears throat> One aspect of that is he'll show you the end of the apparent obstacle. He'll take you right over to where it stops. You can see it for what it is. So you won't want to conform to it. People speak things like they spoke to Jesus and you have a devil. Or you're an imposter. Or you're not the son of God. It didn't face Jesus at all. Because he could see what they were saying for what it is. And the human race is basically caught up with speaking things that it has no idea what it's talking about. So when people come into your life and try to exert pressure on you, or try to get you to conform to a particular situation, if you're open to the renewing process, the Holy Spirit will immediately quicken you to the truth of that circumstance. You can see it, you can see it for what it actually is, and you'll stand your ground. You won't accept it. Same thing with thoughts. Thoughts about your circumstance. <clears throat> You'll see the concept for what it is. And if it is against God's word, you won't consider it. Let's go on. <clears throat> Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verse 23. These are the fourth chapter, verse 23. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That's the second time he repeats that. It's part of the new birth process. He's saying it to give Christians the understanding that if they apply it, they'll walk on in victory in every situation. Without it, they'll walk on in darkness. That'd be the renewing process <coughs> is described as giving us illumination, giving us light, giving us the ability to 
perceive in the realm of light. Uh, turn over to Ephesians, the fifth chapter, verses 11 to 17. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. The renewing process is illumination, light, that comes into your awareness your understanding, your mental faculties. <clears throat> Verse 14. Wherefore, he saith, Awake, thou that sleepest, and rise from the dead, and Christ will give thee light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And repeat verse 17. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. In other words, we're unwise if we don't understand what the will of the Lord is. If we don't understand what the will of the Lord is, we can't redeem the time. We can't walk circumspectly. We're in darkness. <clears throat> How do we get to understand what the will of the Lord is? Turn to Romans, the 12th chapter, verses 1 to 2. Beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Commitment. A life acceptable to God. That's the prime directive. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may be, that ye may prove put to the test what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God understanding the will of God comes through the renewing process when we understand what the will of God is we can prove it we can put it to the test so all of this deals with tapping into the renewing process and an evident change our thinking to conform to <coughs> the thinking of God transformed from the thinking of the world. Jesus was able to stand against the whole world from his intimacy of his family to the scribes and the Pharisees to everybody else because he stood in truth. He knew everything that came against him was false. Was a sham, a deception. The whole human race is steeped in falsehood. You are steeped in truth. So in that respect, when you stand in truth because of what you know, nobody can ever take it away from you. Nobody can ever cause you to uh, pressure you into relinquishing it. You will hold on to it. You give your life up before you give up the truth of who you are, what you represent, where you come from, where you're going. Turn to Galatians, the fourth chapter, verse one. What chapter? Galatians, the fifth chapter. Oh, fifth Galatians 5, verse 1. 
stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. The only way that we can stand fast is to stand fast in the faith, in the operation, the function of the new birth. You cannot stand in the carnal fall. <clears throat> you can stand in the spiritual against every obstacle that would ever come against you. So what he's saying here is we have a fight. Every day, it's 24-7. Something's going to come against you whether it's in the spiritual or it's in the physical, <clears throat> whatever it is. But through the renewing process, it strengthens us and gives us illumination. We'll be able to see it. We'll be able to go against it and prevail against it. We'll never, never have the intense battle that Jesus had. We will have battles but Jesus promises the victory over it because he got the victory over his battle. So expect these things to happen. We live in a world where <clears throat> the scripture tells us sufficient is <clears throat> the day for the day is evil. In other words, where the evil there is Perilous. Every day of our life is perilous. We see the examples in Jesus' ministry. Every day, perils consistently buffeted him. Paul talks about the same thing. Perils. Perils on land, perils on sea, perils of my brethren, perils of strangers. It's a perilous time we live in. But we are given the assurance of victory over it. Now, I'll give you the litmus test. How do you know if you're undergoing the renewing process? How do you know that whatever situation you're dealing with, you're going to get the victory over it? You will know if, when you go through a trial, you have a joy on the inside, you have a peace on the inside. It's your assurance that you are going to prevail. Not to worry about the circumstance. Not to try to analyze every problem, but just realize and relax in the spirit and the peace that you feel will strengthen you to go through the trial. And when you reach that mindset, then God begins to sovereignly move to change your circumstance. It works together. <coughs> Turn to Philippians. Philippians, the fourth chapter, verses six to start verse 6 and read 6 and 7. It says, Be careful for nothing. That means don't worry about anything. Don't stress on anything. Be careful for nothing. But in everything, <clears throat> by prayer and supplication. In other words, this is the formula for a victorious prayer life. When you approach the Father, <clears throat> He doesn't want you coming into His presence stressed out. It's just come boldly before the throne. It means that you come there knowing that you have God's ear, knowing that the Father is going to give you His attention. So you enter into His presence confidently. You can have all the world at your back. 
but just knowing that the mover of heaven and earth is intensely interested in what you have to say. It goes on, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer. In other words, communion with the Father and supplication. The Father wants us to announce our need. He wants us to be specific about what it is that we want him to do. Nothing vague and nebulous, but he wants us to lay it out exactly what's on our heart. Just like when you come to your human father, uh, you have a need. You don't come to him and say, well, you know, uh, I'd sort of like to have, uh, and you mumble under your breath. No, you're going to let him know, Dad, I need the car. Dad, I need 50 bucks. You speak exactly what it is that you expect for him to do. God's the same way. That's what he wants. Be careful for nothing but by, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving that's all important a successful prayer thanksgiving that's saying you expect him to deliver on what you've already asked him for and you're thanking him for it just like if you have confidence with your father I know when we were kids I come to my father and uh, if I needed some bucks I'd say well dad kind of broke this week I knew he was good for it, so I expected him to give it to me. Once, you know, I made it known, he'd reach in his pocket, and there it was. Same thing with God. Thank him for it before you get it. And God has a way of letting us know that he's heard it, and he's going to meet the need by the next passage of Scripture. With thanksgiving, let your request made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding. You will feel that peace on the inside. When you feel that peace, that's God's response. Saying, son, I've heard your prayer. It's going to be taken care of. And you can relax. I mean, things may look like hell all around you. The scripture here says that peace that God gives shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. What I keep there is guard, protect. Whenever something happens, that peace will give you the assurance that what you've asked for is going to manifest. So you don't never look at the circumstance because the mind looks at the circumstance and engages and it always, always misgages. Because the mind is a product of time. And the mind will put a time limit on God. It hasn't happened in six months. I guess it ain't going to happen. That's why you never, never, never pray from the mind. You pray from the heart. And you expect an answer to come through the heart. And that peace, the scripture says, will guard you. It will strengthen you through whatever the trial is until you get your manifestation from it. Abraham waited 25 years. An old man when he started, 75 years old, didn't get the promise until he was 100. But he never slackened, never faltered. He just knew that he knew that he knew it was going to happen. Sometimes we, just the time we give up is when it comes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, in this way, you'll never give up. Because the mind, geared by the heart, stands in eternity. The, the re renewing of your mind is spiritual. And things in the spirit realm are outside of time. Not subject to time. So it doesn't matter if it's 10 minutes or 100 years. The expectation never diminishes. And the manifestation will always appear. <clears throat>